I, I guess I disagree. We went through a, this fire drill on um, a deferred expenditure for replacing wooden poles in one utilities rate case, and uh, it was bitter fight for, with ratepayer advocates as, suggesting that they only be given a little bit more than they had been previously provided, and uh, the coalition of utility employees actually coming in with numbers saying, here's what we think is the reasonable lifespan of the poll. We need more people who can walk in and say that so that we actually can say, okay, this is the portion of the fleet that's ready for, for replacement. Here's the cost of that. This is not something that was previously allowed, and it's a new expense. So have you authorized any funds? or sufficient funds to replace poles that are beyond their reasonable life? We just did that in the Southern California Edison rate case. Okay. Um, just to get back to my question, to the extent that you are seeing lower rates conflict with safety, I think you need to bring those concerns to us, and we need to partner with you to make sure that the money is there, period. Thank you. Okay, let's go to Mr. Obernolte. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Picker, I'd like to ask something about a little bit different, something a little different. So last November, the PUC initiated a proceeding to gather information about uh, competitiveness in the landline telecommunications market in California. I also sit on the budget subcommittee for transportation and natural resources, which, as you know, oversees the PUC. And just this afternoon, across my desk came a budget change proposal requesting a million dollars to study service quality in landline communications in California. So why the sudden interest in landline communications? Because, as I'm sure all of us know, fewer than 50 percent of households in California even have a landline anymore, and only 10 percent rely on that as their sole means of communication. So it just seems incongruous. No, the penetration of landline uh, telecommunications has dropped almost 70 percent in, in the last 10 years. And so this is a, uh, a artifact of a old legal issue, and uh, it's something that we believe the courts would require us to do. And so we're undertaking that. It's probably useful to do that periodically just to make sure that there is a competitive market. Um, I'll leave it to, to, the, to, to the legislature to make the decision as to whether the PUC actually ought to be regulating in industries where there are competitive markets. But as it stands, we have a, a statutory requirement that we do that. And, the, and if, in fact, the, our lawyers believe that we should actually prove that there is a competitive market, we probably will go through that drill. All right. So uh, as part of the proceedings, you're asking for information that goes quite a bit further than just landline communications, and that's alarmed a few people, particularly as regards broadband Internet service providers, which is not something currently under the purview of the PUC. Is that something that you are looking into because you think you would like to regulate it? I'll have to, to apologize and say it's not my proceeding, so I'm not terribly familiar with the, the scope of the, the current investigation. So I can get back to you with the answer to the question, but I just, I'm not that familiar with that specific proceeding. All right. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Ms. Burke. Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. Ms. Eggman. Uh, thank you. So in light of, and my apologies for coming late, and I may have missed this, in light of a lot of the safety issues that have been raised and uh, the infrastructure issues that have been raised, do, do you not have a problem with capacity right now in trying to do what is required of you to keep the public safe? And is it really the best time to be going into trying to regulate an, another market that doesn't necessarily have the, the same safety implications. I, I don't know that the outcome of, the, of that proceeding would actually be to regulate the uh, landlines. It may be just to prove that there actually is a competitive market. We're a very deliberative body. We have to collect evidence to substantiate almost everything we do. I, I sometimes find it frustrating, but it is important for us to have a published record that everybody can refer to that supports the decisions that we make. And so it is in the nature of deliberative bodies, just like courts, that you have to really go through each of these steps and, and make sure that everybody has a chance to, to have a say and that the evidence is there to support or disprove their positions before we make a decision. So, um, but I, so I don't know what the outcome of that will be. I just think we, we know that we have to substantiate a decision that was made eight, nine years ago. 
Okay, and I guess my my question remains the one of capacity of, of, of capacity and prioritizing. I think that I think that the, there's a great need for prioritizing. I mean, I I will be very blunt with you and say that over the last week, as I was on vacation, I started to really come to my own personal judgment that maybe we shouldn't be doing telecom anymore at all, nor should we be doing. Um, um, uh, some of the transportation functions that we do. They're competitive markets, in my mind. Um, they are not something that we necessarily can do effectively given the limited authorities that we have. And so a real question for me is should the CPUC be doing them? Should things that are largely ministerial like uh, cable um, uh, registration, should that be done by the Department of Consumer Affairs? Should uh, TNC and limousine regulation be done by the, the Department of Motor Vehicles and the CHP? No, is that, it's is that an my endorsement pay grade, of, of my, I, but of my ACA? It sounds like an endorsement of my ballot initiative. Well, I, I'm sorry, I haven't seen it, so I can't say. Well, it's, it's been all over the papers, Mr. Pick. I, you know, I, have, I am sorry, I've been on vacation. S I am not somebody to stand back from a discussion of reforms at the CPUC. I think with, that everybody has different ideas what reforms mean. Got it. Okay, we're going to go to Ms. Burke, followed by Mr. Hadley. Ms. Burke. I'm so blown away by the TNC thing. I've actually almost forgot my question. I am. Um, uh, so I have a storage facility. Somebody needs to do I, it. Yes, I got that. I just was surprised to hear you suggest it wouldn't be you. Well, there's a lot of things that we do that probably other people could do, but for reasons of history or lack of, uh, of interest or will on other people's uh, parts, we do them because somebody's got to do them. Um, and I, so I'm going to start with this question, and then I do have a question about some... some I, I will say this is my personal position. It's not yeah. an organizational position. It's not something that you've tasked us with yet. So. No. But, so I'm going to start with this. So you did mention that I do have a storage facility in my district, and you had mentioned that you had requested a review of those facilities. Can I ask what, uh, how comprehensive that review is, um, what the process moving forward is after those reviews are done, and then will there be a contingency policy for those facilities, kind of like we didn't have with Aliso, if they must come offline? So the challenge for us is that we don't have expertise and we don't have specific authority over wells. And so a challenge for us after Aliso Canyons is how do we make sure that all of the infrastructure, including the geology and the, the, uh, the wells, actually have integrity. We understand the pipelines. That's what we've been doing for the last uh, 40, 50 years. That's what the, we have as an authority that's passed on to us by the federal government through the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration. They don't have authority over wells, and neither do we. That's the division of oil, gas, and geothermal research. So that's part of what we're trying to do is get better acquainted with the integrity of the wells and the rest of the infrastructure and the storage facilities that we don't normally look at. And we'll probably spend a lot of time working with the division of oil, gas, and geothermal research to answer all those questions that, that, that you're raising. But right at this point, we're doing the information gathering. We'll sit down. We'll assess it. We'll go talk to them. We may have to bring on our own consultants to help us because of their constraints and, and challenges. They have something like uh, 35,000 other operating gas and oil wells throughout the state they also have responsibility for. And we just haven't gotten that far. I, I don't want to say this because it's a little harsh, but it feels like... It's never I, stopped you, Ms. Burke. I know, and it's never stopped me before, so I'm not going to let it stop me today. Um, it's a little frustrating, I think, when I come to these, and I came last year to another one. Um, clearly, there is some responsibility that CPUC holds. I mean, in the C, whether that's in Aliso Canyon or in my district, you know, to the storage facility I have there. That's so it's Playa hard. Vista. Yes, in yeah. Playa Vista. So it's hard for me to understand how all of a sudden it's just it's about a report from oil and gas. It just seems like on some level that you do have authority and we've all come to you today because you have, not today, but over the last couple months, especially with Aliso, because you do have some authority and some responsibility there. And I just, I would love to try and consider it my naivete, but I, I find it hard to believe that this buck could be continued to be passed and quite frankly, that there was no redundancy in the situation with Aliso and that in no way falls in your purview. 
Well, think of us as an audit agency. You know, that's essentially what we do. We're an economic regulator, and we're constantly auditing. So we're like any auditor, you'll go do spot checks to make sure that their control systems work and that they, they actually are performing the things that their control systems uh, tell us that they're gonna do. So you audit, you go out and spot check, you verify, and that's the basis under which we operate. We have all of a thousand employees spread across five different industries and a variety of different functions, and that includes the Office of Ratepayer Advocates. We have maybe 80 gas operation safety branch inspectors, or excuse me, staff period, and not all of them are inspectors. So we will never be able to give the kind of coverage that the utilities do. When there was a point where we had 155 uh, motor carrier inspectors who went out every day to look at commercial trucking uh, on a daily basis with the CHP officer, but we lost that with deregulation. And so, obviously, with five um, field people for the, the motor carrier division, we're not gonna cover a lot of limousines, buses, and, uh, and, uh, and TNCs. It goes back to your capacity question. And so again, that's why we function as, a, as an auditor. We function for rate compliance, we function for ensuring that they expend on the things that they say they're gonna do, and we audit for safety. We are not truly a field organization. Um, Tim Sullivan, Executive Director. That's the design, I'm sorry. I actually have the statistics uh, for gas safety inspectors. We have only 26 for the whole state. Electric safety, 22. Transportation enforcement, 22. Uh, but rail, we have 80. So that's uh, an example. Is, is that a relic of the, the old railroad commission days? Uh, I mean, we're yes, to... actually, wow. that's an interesting program. It's been for 100 years. Uh, it uh, doesn't attract much uh, scrutiny from the legislature, uh, but actually they do a fairly solid job. They walk every mile of track in the state each year in conjunction with the uh, Federal Railway Authority, and which pays for most of the program. Well, that's a job that I want. That sounds like a great way to see America, see America but... Uh. Well, mostly you wind up seeing our mountain passes where most of the risk are. So, so whenever I'm frustrated and in a state of despair, that's what I think about. There's those guys out there. <laughs> Yeah, they, they go and look at every foot of track every year. They go and visit each of the crossing guards twice a year. They ha that's where we actually have coverage, and that's where we actually have a safety culture. Uh, we had a, uh, a train de derail in my district last night. Uh, Senator uh, Selmy Quirk was taking care of us. But they were in coming my to my district. district. But they were coming to my district. Oh, okay. yes. My All right. Okay. Let's go, to, let's go to Mr. Hadley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And... Uh, Ring the gong when you need to. Um, for, I got several things I want to follow up on. Uh, first, we had this discussion. Uh, my colleagues Obernolte and Eggman raised this issue about uh, price setting and and uh, safety, and, and that you're an organization at the at the nexus of that. Uh, I, I want to use an example from my district and actually from my my colleague Burke's district as well. Uh, Golden State Water and the city of Gardena. Um, the residents of Gardena have been complaining about their water for years. Uh, we have had everybody from, you know, the mayor to Aaron Brockovich lead town halls in the city. Uh, just in the last two weeks, I've gotten 75 postcards on the subject of, of water. Um, and, and yet nothing has happened, and we have very few tools at our disposal, it seems. And in 2013, 2014, and 2015, the PUC approved rate increases of 15%, 2.6%, 2% in Gardena for Golden State Water. And when a regulated utility on a, on a rate of return um, you know, regulatory framework is continuing to receive rate increases when the quality of the service they're providing is manifestly unacceptable to a large chunk of its, its service community. If not via the rate structure, how are we, how are we attacking this problem? 
I don't have a good answer to your question. I should probably know more about Gardena. I haven't seen the complaints. But generally, the regulated water industry seems to be doing better than many of the municipals. Then, particularly in the recent drought, they seem to have actually been able to serve communities with publicly owned water agencies that have failed, particularly in the Central Valley. So I would be happy to look into the specifics there and sit down and talk with you and your staff and go into this one deeper, but I just don't think I can really answer we, it here. We would probably love to take you up on okay. that because we've, we've struggled with this for a while. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I'm not criticizing the investor-owned utility model. I'm criticizing our inability to stop rate increases even when there's been a failure of service delivery. Uh, which is where the where the PUC comes in. Uh, so we will we will definitely follow up with you and your team on that. Uh, my second follow up, um, you know, forgive my skepticism, but I I find the PUC selective in its its uh, strict uh, you know pursuit of you know complying with legislative framework. This this. Um, study of the competitiveness of the of the telecommunications business is you know it would take about three minutes online to determine that the telecommunications business is vastly more competitive than it was 10 years ago when this topic was last studied uh, and on the other hand in 2011 the legislature uh, in the context of cap and trade uh, Set a, set a requirement for the PUC to essentially uh, uh, provide a framework by which there would be cost off ramps or an understanding of the cost impacts of the renewable portfolio standard. This was uh, AB2X in 2011. This was required to be done by January of 2016. Uh, it should have been done before SB 350 was deliberated on, let alone voted on. Uh, I'm here as somebody uh, who voted for SB 350 on the floor, and one of the reasons I almost didn't vote for it was that the, the, uh, the essential trade-offs that we're trying to make in a very complicated policy area need to be informed by cost, uh, cost considerations as well as by our other policy goals, carbon, carbon emissions and so on. And and yet, despite a 2011 statutory requirement that the PUC uh, create a framework by which cost uh, and, the, and, the, and the, the maximum cost of complying with the RPS mandates, uh, those were deleted. That requirement was modified in SB 350, and the can was kicked down the road. So uh, I, it doesn't make any sense to me that the PUC is dedicating staff resources and regulatory resources to an obviously competitive telecommunications business, and yet, on the other hand, for five years in an area that is arguably the most significant policy area of state innovation in the last five years, the PUC simply hasn't done what the legislature asked it to do in 2011. So how do those, how do those allocation decisions of resources and priorities get made? Well, I'll apologize for not having read the, the the legislative language that goes back to 2011. I was at that point I was busy building renewable energy projects and watching the price drop. So I was not here either. So uh, I will apologize for my ignorance, and uh, probably the best thing I can do is promise to get back to you with an answer because I I don't know about that. I just don't. I'll, I'll, I'll keep going if you let me, but I want. You, of course, absolutely. This is this is a hearing. Go uh, ahead. So the RPS off ramps uh, was that part of SB two X? Uh, correct in two thousand and eleven, and and we're happy to follow up with you afterwards as well. Um, you know, on the matter of the ex parte communications uh, that uh, that obviously preceded your your leadership as president of the PUC. Uh, there has been effort to hold uh, the utilities accountable for their role. What has happened within the What has happened within the PUC? You know, these communications have been w between utilities and and 
both appointed and, and career member, members of the PUC. What has happened inside the organization? Well, I'll point out that ex parte communications are actually allowed and yes. in many cases encouraged. There are inappropriate ex parte communications. They take place in judicial proceedings. They are, uh, if they take place in a different kind of proceeding or rate setting, then the, the utility or the other interested party is supposed to actually report that to all the other parties, and that's failed. And so it was an issue in some of the PG&E fines. It's been an issue subsequent to that. I, I can't go into the details, but I am the presiding, the assigned commissioner on a, uh, a investigation of, of further PG&E ex parte communications. The commissioner uh, Sandoval is following up on, uh, on an investigation of uh, ex parte communications that took place in uh, in the San Onofre natural uh, na nuclear generating um, uh, station case, and uh, probably will have some kind of a uh, a action in the next couple months. So um, I think that we've become more aggressive on that. In addition, we've taken steps to actually focus on an accountability from commissioner to commissioner on this, and so. When I got to the CPUC, there was no such thing as a job description for a commissioner. We didn't have a code of conduct that we actually adopted as commissioners that said, here's what our obligations are to each other and to the organization and to ratepayers. We've done that. We've been looking at a, bear, a, a number of different kinds of reforms to, to some of these issues. But, but having said that, uh, I'll, I'll just say that this is still a issue that only really is is accessible to people who go before a judge or admitted as parties. There are many things that we do that part that that parties who are admitted by the judge have access to that the general public doesn't have access to. There are some of our proceedings that um, people don't have the same standing to participate in, uh, but they're of broad general interest. They don't affect the, the, the property interests of a particular utility or company. They affect a whole broad class. They're like implementation of legislation. But our, our rules actually make it a less transparent process simply because you have to be admitted at a party to have the same kind of access to the rate make, to the, to the, excuse me, to the, to the, the uh, rulemaking process. So I think that there's, there's, there's both a necessity to deal with unauthorized or unreported ex parte communications because it's unfair to the other parties, but I also wrestle with what about these broad legislative policy implementation tasks that you set for us where these rules make it hard for people to participate because they can't afford the cost of becoming parties? Is there a different kind of transparency that we can create by opening up the process to everybody in a process that's similar to um, um, the notice and comment process that, that people deal with under the Administrative Procedure Acts in almost every other state agency. Mr. Picker, I'm, I was engaging in shorthand. I wasn't, here to I, I wasn't here to suggest that all ex parte communications are inappropriate or illegal. My point is that utilities have paid appropriately, have paid multi-million dollar fines for inappropriate and illegal ex parte communications has anybody in the PUC been held accountable for participating in inappropriate or illegal ex parte communications? I don't have the answer to that because it's above my pay grade. I do know that there are two prosecutions underway, investigations for prosecutions. There's, there are federal uh, investigations and, and, uh, um, and a uh, attorney general investigation into to those issues. I can't say what they're about to do. I don't know. And have, have there been any changes to practice within the PUC in terms I of your management of your people around these issues? Is there accountability uh, on that level? A couple other examples, and I'm sure the executive director will talk about a few. Um, we not only have a, uh, a 
commissioner code of conduct, a job description, and we also have a uh, process by which in certain cases we publicly post from the commissioner side, not the, the, the admitted party side, all ex party communications. And so I think we're struggling to figure out what's the best thing to do from within. Okay, and then yeah. I, have, I have one more. Okay, one more question, one more. Mr. Hadley. Uh, on the Lifeline program, as, we, as has been talked about here previously, um, demand for, for basic telecommunication services has been plummeting. Um, and yet, uh, you know, the percentage of a consumer's bill that is being, uh, uh, that's being surcharged for Lifeline services has, has continued to increase. Uh, you know, both because we're here to protect ratepayers and because we have, I think, a, a desire to ensure that, uh, that scarce resources are devoted to needed services and maybe there's broadband uses or other uses for, for these kinds of funds. How, how do we uh, manage the Lifeline program in a world where plain old telephone service is not the lifeline that it once was? It's a very good question. And I don't think I really completely understand the answers. There are two lifeline programs. There's one that, that pertains to the, the wireline programs, which help to fund uh, um, service for, for additional customers, um, um, particularly for, for wireless customers. I'm, I have the VOAP lifeline proceeding and curiously two providers actually uh, asked to be covered by a CPCN. So uh, in the VOIP lifeline we have this very strange situation where most people who use voice over internet product protocol are not regulated but we have two providers because they actually asked to be provided with a CPCN who are. So again, I struggle to understand what the framework is at all by which we're dealing with telecommunications. It's just so diverse. It goes from DIVCA, which is the cable registration program. Cable companies come to us, they pay a fee. It's a largely ministerial process. They, we, they check the boxes and then they go operate. Um, the the um, very little impact on broadband, except that we provide a stipend for broadband services for low-income customers. Um, do we have an obligation to then provide them with consumer protections? Um, it, it's not completely clear to me what the law says, but there are many people at the CPUC who believe that we have an obligation to continue to provide some kind of uh, consumer protection services through our Consumer um, uh, Assistance Bureau. Uh, we do, we do, and everybody has lauded our efforts in, in terms of protecting people against cramming and slamming. What do we do about uh, about uh, these combined VOIP bundled packages? I, it's just I, I'm mystified as how we make sense of this. And Thank I'll you. be very honest with you that the commission itself is divided as to how we, we should proceed. And I know that that based on the the direction we get from from various members of the legislature, that there's different visions here. Thank you very much. We have a number more questions that we're going to try to get into. Um, uh, we're going to go to Ms. Ms. Burke, followed by Mr. Patterson and then Mr. Quirk. Then we're going to open it up for public comment, and then we'll come back to the dais for a last round of questions. So, Ms. Burke. Just to follow up on uh, Assemblyman Hadley's kind of line of questioning. So last year there were a number of bills, obviously, that, um, were, that I supported to reform the operations of the CPUC. And whether that were communication or safety bills, I'm just curious, were, were there any of those that you were in support of or that the commissioners were in support of? Personally? I'll be honest that I didn't read all of them carefully. This is the first year that I've been on the legislative subcommittee. I will admit that I'm struggling to keep track of the new crop of legislation. I'll say that one of the bills that I especially was interested in and continue to be interested in is uh, reform of Public Utility Code 583. We have two different statutes that relate to uh, public records requests of us. The, the Public Records Act, uh, uh, Section 6250, and uh, sec of the 
the California government code, re basically says that any, any document that's in the hands of government, and, and unless it meets certain tests, is a public document and should be provided to the public. Uh, but we have another 1953 statute that says that if it's stamped as confidential by a utility, it's confidential. So that w that's something I would eagerly like to see reformed. And I know you mentioned that last year when we were here. I just was curious on, on the package. So that's the only... I, I, I go back and forth on this question of of whether it makes sense for the commissioners to report all our ex-party contacts. I think it's actually a, a reasonable thing to do, and it gives people a check um, between um, um, what the parties, and not just the utilities, because there are other parties who approach us um, and have, have, would like to have ways of sharing information with us whether it's on the street or it's a meeting or, or, or some other uh, format, sometimes letters, that they should share with all the other parties who admitted to the proceedings. And so having the commissioners disclose that as well would provide a check and a balance. And that would be a very effective tool in those rate-setting cases. Again, there's three different kinds of cases. There's the, the quasi-legislative, which is implementing legislative policy that doesn't pertain to any one entity. It pertains to a whole class of entities. There's no ex parte requirement. Second is rate setting where there's a requirement that, we, that the party who has, has an ex parte communication disclose it. And then as a commissioner, I have a requirement to give equal time to other parties. And then there's judicial cases where we shouldn't have any contact with ex parte contact with, with, uh, with parties at all. So, yeah. Okay, let's go to Mr. Patterson. 